So how you guys doing? Today's today's topic is on sellers. Um, so finding seller leads, and we're still kind of on the grow part of the business. So we're just talking about how to find and where to find sellers. I mean, for this to be most beneficial for you and for you to get the most stuff out of it. So I cover things that will help you grow your seller side of the business. I mean, listings are short. Where are you guys finding buyers? What are you trying that you're struggling with? Um, or are we not really trying and we're just kind of waiting for them to come or, or what's really happening out there in the real world with sellers when it pertains to sellers? Do you not know where to go look for them? What are you guys dealing with? I guess it'd probably be better to have more sellers because that then turns around and it's an easier avenue to get more buyers. Yeah, we're actually, I, I mean, that's a good point, Brad. We're going to talk about that today where I'm going to tell you three different ways that you can find some hidden listings that most people aren't looking for. However, you're probably going to pick up buyers as well. And one of them's a reiteration from even just uh, on Monday, but it's good to hear it again because we talked about it from the buyer perspective, how to find the buyers, yet three-fourths of buyers are actually sellers. So that was a national statistic I saw once. It was like 72 or 73% of all buyers are typically sellers too. So only about 25% of the buyers out there don't have a house to sell, which, and, and you know, just having a high level conversation around it, guys, <clears throat> there's, there's the bigger question. So for all the business that's coming in from internet leads and sign calls, if you really start tracking this, if that's the case and I get 10 buyers from an internet site, I can get them on the phone, then technically there should be seven listings that come out of those 10 buyers. And I don't know that anybody, I don't know of many agents at all, at least you know my experiences from who I've coached and some of the top teams but buyer and leads are coming in and they're not getting the same number of listings for the leads that are coming in. You know, um, some of the teams, you can look at a team that where you got a listing and, and I don't know if there's any teams on here that could even speak to this where you're the rainmaker and, you know, they do 50, 60 sales, mostly listings. And then they can have three or four buyer's agents doing about 50 or 60 sales. So granted, you can work with more sellers than buyers. You can work with, statistically, they say about seven buyers, active buyers at any given time, but you could literally carry 30 or 40 sellers at, at the same time. Yet you would think if you had three agents working on buyers, that if three-fourths of those had listings coming in, there wouldn't even be any listing tra or, or generating more listings. You would have enough coming in from just the buyers and it takes those three people sell about the same as one person. So it's, I don't know, just statistically, it's weird. I'm just kind of throwing it out there as a statistic to say, hey, you might want to just watch your numbers. And if you're not, if you're getting buyers and not getting a listing appointment for almost every buyer that comes in, you might be missing some opportunities. And I don't know where they go. Uh, I mean, it's not like they buy a house with one agent and list their house with another 90% of the time. I mean, 70, 70 something percent, 80 percent of the time, they're going to go with the same agent that they're buying a house with. But for some reason, it doesn't translate. I don't, I'm not sure what the deal is, but definitely a number worth watching. All right, cool. Well, um, what do you guys want to get out? Of, is there anything that you would like to get out of today that has to do with sellers? Anything particular that you might think you want to know? Now, I'm telling you, if you guys want to grow your business fast, it is sellers. It's finding listings because that's going to drive buyers. You're going to drive multiple offers. You're going to make them a lot of money. You're going to sell it fast. And so another part, when we move into elements, like we're on spark number eight right now, we got one more spark and then we're moving into the how-to on the business. Oh, that's my cue to move my slide over. Um, then we'll be moving over to the run your business. and 
now I forgot what I was going to say about the listings on that. Um, that's going to drive the business and you can control your checkbook, the market and everything with the listings, the buyers, it, what you're going to, in, in the run part of your business, you're going to want to set up your marketing so that you can capture as many buyers as possible in like no time flat, because it's going to go under contract fairly quick if it has multiple offers. Uh, I think I was talking with Cole yesterday and he was just sharing just what is it since January 1st, I think there's only been 80 properties that have even come on the market in Topeka and they're every house that came on since January is gone. They're not available. So I don't know. Do you guys watch the MLS? Do you check the MLS to see what's hitting the market and what's coming on and what's going off? Is anybody doing that? Yeah. yeah. Are there, how many active listings would you say there are right now? I mean, it kind of made it sound like there were none at the moment. <laughs> Uh, they were in the 70s, I think. Yeah. Oh, I will I will say he did say Topeka, like if they were Topeka, not not the MLS area. He was just saying the actual city of Topeka had 80. I, I needed to clarify that because he did say, now I just put in Topeka, Kansas as the city. So anything in the little lake communities and all that wasn't calculated in there. All right, well, let's get into some stuff here because I've got some fun stuff to share with you. Um, and again, a lot of this is just based on from coaching top agents and actually coaching calls actually come up with more really cool ideas than just sitting there doing it yourself or trying to figure out what to do next. So today we're still kind of hitting on lead generating for sellers, but it's really where to find the sellers. And hopefully I will, exp I hope you guys will take this and like go back and look at your notes and really like start doing some of this stuff. So you can call me and go, hey, I pulled up this search the way you showed it and I found these. And then we're gonna take it to the next step and actually like find their contact information and call them and get them. But the big thing is just working the database will be the bigger conversation that comes out of this today. For example, um, somebody had just shared we were talking about sellers and they were sharing, you know, so I've got this seller who it's a friend that told me that they're going to be selling, that they're going to, they need to find a realtor to help them sell their house. But the agent didn't know that person. They just knew a friend of theirs. Right. And it's like, so what should I send them? Should I send them a letter in the mail? What should I, you know, brochure, all that stuff. And it's kind of funny. Like when we go to that, path because the industry has taught us to go find the next deal and calling for sale by owners, calling expireds, calling that stuff. When in actuality, if you've got a, if, if you know somebody's selling and they're asking their friend a realtor and you happen to be friends with them, the next thing to say is because this person that knew, that told you that they are looking for a realtor, you're not dripping on them enough yet that they would have been in that conversation and go, well, I know exactly who you need to call, right? So this person hasn't been well connected with where you just called them out of the blue, checked in with them, wrote them the note. They're not in your master list. So they're not getting into command and they're not getting on a drip plan. When you focus on your database and you have all this going, when those things happen and somebody says, we're thinking about selling, we need to start interviewing realtors, that's where all of this stuff where we're talking about the five a day, just checking in, family, occupation, recreation, what are they doing, those things, and connecting and then putting them on a drip, knowing that 98% of them are not moving right now. That's where the referral piece comes in. And I'm telling you, in all my years of selling real estate, I have not seen agents capture the referral side. We all, I mean, there, there's agents in, there's programs out there that are referral-based programs and they're pretty big programs. I mean, big speakers that have been around for a long time. And I know one of the challenges was one of them said like, you should get a referral from everybody you're working with during the transaction, why it's a good transaction. There is nobody that I know in the industry period that's getting one-for-one -one referrals and clients. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to work that hard. I mean, if you did 10 transactions last year, you'd be at 20. And focusing on that and working on programs to make that happen, it never, never happened.
But what it did do is it increased dramatically by just getting in touch with people, staying in touch with people so that when those conversations happen, you're top of mind. It's top of mind awareness marketing that it's meet somebody, connect, write the note that makes them feel good. And I, I'm just going to do a little recap here, but on the limbic part of the brain is the defense mechanism that blocks all the information that comes at us every single day. And there's so much going on in our head right now. We don't have time to just let everything come in. So we have to process it. And if I'm selling you on something and I don't really have time to listen to it, I'm just going to, oh, got a question. Oh, okay. I'm just going to block it and not really process what you're saying. So you could go into your spiel and you guys do this with salespeople on the phone or at the store or whatever. If they start going into a sale and you're not interested in it, you're just not even really processing what they're saying. But the handwritten note, it feels good. It's like, it was so great connecting, glad the family's doing well. It's like, ah, it makes me feel good that you, pro you get past that limbic part of the brain and they say subconsciously, you're safe. You're not here to waste their time or sell them something else or do whatever. And they don't necessarily always say that in a bad way. I say it because that's the way we think that it's happening, right? But they don't want to be sold and all this other stuff. We've heard those statements before. So they're going to process everything that comes through when they know you actually care about them. And that's why the note is magical. And if you skip it, you'll kind of, you just, it, it's going to be harder to break that relate into that relationship to where if a friend or a family member is saying we we need to interview realtors that they don't just go oh my gosh i know exactly who you need to call there's nothing you've done right now that that is happening enough because you can all do more business right people are not waking up every day jumping out of their bed and running out to find you sellers so we're going to talk about all that today the different places to find sellers however the underlying 90% value is work your database, work that master list and connect with people so that when this other situation comes up. Now, I'm going to play on that just a little bit more because we're talking about finding sellers right now. And then we'll, it, it, we're kind of in the content a little bit on finding sellers, but it matches this story. So if it, if, if it were me and I were an agent and I heard that and it's somebody that I know, I would have said, well, how well do you know them? Can you set it up and let them know that, that you do know a realtor and I'm calling? So that would be my first shot. But chances are that would have already happened if they were that good. Maybe they just heard it, right? So the next step would be start thinking strategically. So I know they're interviewing realtors and I don't have the shot yet. Me mailing them something or emailing them something, they don't know who I am, isn't going to get me the appointment any faster. But if I go to Facebook, you know, when you go to Facebook and your friends list, if you've been checking your list out and writing those people down in your master list, whenever you go to other people, like if I searched that person and pulled them up on Facebook and I went to their friends list, it would show me the mutual friends that we have. The mutual friends that we have are the people that I need to pick up and forward on. How you doing? It's been a little while since we talked. What are you up to? So my ultimate goal is to see if they know this person well enough that if they, and, and if they do, you know, they might say, oh, they're like, they're like family to us. It's like, well, I heard they're selling and talking to realtors. Do you know them well enough to let them know, you know me? Oh yeah, I could definitely do that. That's what we're looking for. Right? So if we have five mutual friends on Facebook, I'm going to call those five people, not with that to start off to connect with them first. So I can write them the note so I can put them on an eight by eight and drip on them. Now, somewhere in the conversation, if I connect enough, I'm gonna say, hey, by the way, I, I'm actually, I'm curious if you know the Joneses. Oh yeah, we know the Joneses or, or oh, they're people at our church or whatever. It's like, okay, I just, I, I saw that we were friends on Facebook and um, I thought, I didn't know how well you knew them, right? And I'm done with that. But the one that says we're like family members, I might say, well, I had heard that they were thinking about selling and they were looking for realtors and uh, I don't know them well enough that they've called me yet. So I don't know if that's anything that you can put in a good word for me. And they're either going to say, yeah, or I don't know them that well that they would refer me, whatever. So that's a lot better shot than just dropping something in the mail. You can still drop it in the mail if you want. In fact, if you get that third party endorsement and they mention your name and then something shows up in the mail, that's probably going to have a little more weight. Now, OK, so I'm, I'm sharing a couple secrets where you can find listings, right? So I'm going to tap onto this mutual friends list. <clears throat> If you create your master list and you're filling in phone number and address for as many people as you can find, and that's your, your call list, 
If you go through your list and pull up every single person in your master list, if you pull up their friends list, you're going to have mutual friends. And you can check to make sure the mutual friend is in your notebook because chances are you're going to add another hundred people that are in their Facebook. Well, actually, if you took your Facebook list, then you should have them in your notebook if you did it 100%. Most people don't do it 100%. So you're going to find a couple people that aren't in your notebook yet because you didn't do 100% when you first started. But the next step is just to scan through the Facebook friends list of the person that's in your notebook. You're looking at their friends list and you're going to pick up three or four or five more people that you do know really well that you haven't friended on Facebook yet that are mutual. They would be mutual friends if they were on your Facebook list, but they're not. And you're going to add those people to your notebook because you do know, oh, well, fruit, they're from school, they're from high school, they're from this, they're from that. And again, you can you could double and quadruple your master list just by going off your friends, friends list, because then we can start going into your friends, friends, friends list, your friends, 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 friends list. You guys see what I'm saying? There is so there, there is an unlimited number of people that you already know, just even through Facebook alone, that you would never have to lead generate to a stranger for business. Now, you don't shut that piece off it's in the millionaire book. You still have your haven't met ring of business. But when you master that relationship side and you're talking to people that know you and, and you regain that trust with them, you'll be the go to person for real estate. Does that make sense? I mean, how many of you just got a little bit excited about, holy crap, I could just sit on Facebook every day and just build a list like unbelievable. Oh yeah, Sean's excited, I can tell. He's like, heck yeah. Oh, you're muted, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Hey, so on that, so you put them on an eight by eight then or would you put them on a, the 12, 12 by 12 one? Yeah, good, great question. So anybody that I haven't connected with is always a 12 touch according to the book. And the purpose is if I have their address and their, and their, e if I just have an email or something like that, and I want to get them in my database, I can put them on a 12 touch because I haven't talked to them yet. Right. So it's 12 touch. The 12 touch is only going to convert for you though, at about a quarter percent to a 1% return. Right. 50 to one, right? Right. 50 to one. It's 2% if you've been doing it for, if you're a millionaire agent, you've been in business for 20 years and you've been marketing, it's 2%. Um, but that same person, if at that point you just pick up the phone and call them and reconnect, and then you can write them a note because you had a good conversation and you reconnected. Now you get to put them on the eight by eight and that's a 12 to two return, 12 to one, yeah, 12 to two return, 50 to one, 12 to two, that's a 12 to two return. So from the same group of people, that's why you don't want to just take your thousand Facebook friends and just throw them in your database. I mean, you can and put them on a 12 touch because you're just hoping to capture one or two deals here and there. But the purpose is to get them off of that as fast as possible at five a day, every day until the end of the year. And you're that regimented about it that now you just turn that same thousand people into a hundred transactions or at least 25 or 50 until you can figure out how you do more, right? So you're gonna have it falling out of the sky and you can refer what you can't get to. You could also start raising your price range up and not working with the $20,000 people. Those people that come in from the internet that haven't been approved or they're struggling to barely qualify and all this other stuff. So your world will just open up when you get all those opportunities. Okay, Brad, I've got another example of, of using your friends to secure clients is I had a guy that came through an open house that in the open house, he was animate. He wasn't going to work with an agent. He didn't need one to buy a house, blah, 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 blah. And I found out that he worked with one of my friends. So I reached out to my friend. I said, Hey, can you give me, can you put in a good word for me? So when I followed up with this guy a week later, um, he finally answered the phone. He said, you know what, if, if he trusts you, I trust you. And he, he's under contract now to close next month. Guys, don't make this stuff up. That's real world stuff right there. That's what we're talking about. And that's doing it at a high level, high level. Thanks for sharing. That is seriously like for real. And that happens all day long. And I mean, how much, how did you have to convince him to come in for a buyer consultation and make him sign a buyer agency agreement before you even took him out and showed him one house? Probably not. No, right. once, once my friend gave me the endorsement, that was all it took. Yeah. So 
just think like on referrals for real is what you want is an army of people out there that if somebody says the word real estate, it's like you put them in a trance and your face pops in their head and they're like, oh my God, you got to call. And that's what is happening out there to get those referrals up. And that, but see, again, that you're going to be 98% of the time, you're talking to people that aren't doing anything. You're just staying top of mind. Real estate stuff will always come up in those conversations and you'll be able to establish yourself as the expert over time versus trying to convince somebody you know enough on one call and they don't know who you are. Man, that's a real world example right there, guys. I can't make that one up. So cool. Um, so we're gonna go over a couple other ways that you're gonna find these sellers as we get through here too. I mean, obviously, if you are doing any cold calling, make sure you check the do not call list and abide by all those rules and laws and all that other stuff. But finding the seller leads, we're going to, oh, I'm going to give you a couple of them right now before we get in here, get you guys all pumped up on some different ways that you can do it. So I've got a few more examples of ways to find sellers. So one is your Facebook friends, friends, friends list. Keep going as far as you can. By the way, when you're doing your master list too, I mean, even if it's like Instagram or Snapchat or all this other stuff, what you do is you follow people and you connect with people and people are following you on these different social media apps. It doesn't matter if you use them or don't use them, or I don't really like to play that social media game. You probably still have people following you or doing something if you have an account. So right down there, like um, my house, I call it the corn castle with K's, right? So I'm, I might be at corn castle on Snapchat. Write that down in your master list book, because then when you come to it, you're going to do the research to figure out who at Corn Castle is, for example, and they go, oh, that's Brad. And then now you got Brad. Now you fill in the next piece of the puzzle to see if you can find an address. And then you can see if you if I'm in your phone, you got my phone number and you just start piecing the puzzle together and have that list to feed from. But a couple other things that you can do to find sellers. Um, I created a class a while back and it was called Find the Hidden Listings. And I probably already shared this one with you. And there's not a whole lot of door knocking going on, but yet people still bring up door knocking questions and people act like they're gonna door knock. So seriously, if door knocking is an option for you, when you go to a neighborhood, if you Google that, Google map the neighborhood, blow it up big, like put it on your wall and where you can see each square of the house, right? And just draw a line through the neighborhood like a maze. If you were to walk past every single door, how would you do that? Like you'd walk down one side of the sidewalk into the cul-de-sacs, come all the way back out to the entrance again, jump across the street, go inside those cul-de-sacs. Just draw a line like that's your, your path. If I were going to take over a neighborhood and find listings, let's say the neighborhood has 100, 100, 500 homes in it. Is that, is, is 500 homes an okay size neighborhood in Topeka? Are they smaller? Are they bigger? What would you guys say? I mean, is that, it's most smaller. neighborhoods are usually like around that. What do you think, Jackie? Smaller. Smaller? 250, 300. 250, 300. Okay, so we'll just, we'll stick, we'll stick with 250. So it's got 250 homes. I got the map drawn out, right? Now this is how you find sellers because some, a lot of top agents will talk about marketing to a neighborhood, doing a postcard mailing. We're going to commit. We're going to do it over five years. And we're trying to get what percentage like of a neighborhood would you like to get or that you would do if you were marketing? Does anybody do any marketing neighborhoods and like shoot for a certain amount of market share? Or have you heard any of those conversations before? I mean, most top agents will say we want to get 10% market share or 20% market share. Does that sound like something you might have heard before? So let's just say you want to get, go ahead. Oh, no. I was going to say, yeah, in my neighborhood, um, my, my particular neighborhood already had an agent that pretty much owned my neighborhood because she lived in it. She was on the HOA board. And so she's been here for ages. But if I could get three out of her, away from her and, all that it'd be a success for my side well actually so let, I, I do i love this masterful side of the conversation how many homes are in your neighborhood uh probably about 150 150 okay and so if 150 if the average person is moving every five to ten years and check your mls on these statistics there's somewhere between 15 to 30 of the people in your neighborhood should be moving about every year right right 
Now, what I hear agents say every single time I've heard this, there's an agent in my neighborhood that dominates. Pull up that agent's name. And this is an existing neighborhood, right? Not a new construction. Correct. Okay. This is going to blow you blow you away. And let me know what you come up with. But every time we've checked into this and pulled up the neighborhood and searched that agent's search or, or sales, never like in that example they would have no more than three or maybe five total listings in a year in that neighborhood i mean i can go neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood search all the sales in the last 12 months sort it by agent and i've never seen like an agent that had 10 of the 15 sales that would be dominating a neighborhood you're going to have 10 individual agents and then this one or one will have two, one might have three, and then this other agent has five. And that's the most. And then everybody else is one-offs. Now, I, I don't know if that's the case. I'd love for you to check and just see what you come up with. And the reason why I bring it up is because a lot of times agents say there's somebody that already dominates that neighborhood. And that's what caused us to start asking this question and looking. And it's like, oh my gosh, they don't dominate anything. I mean, they got five listings, so they dominate more than anybody else. But that left 10 to 20, 25 listings to grab. Right. So if you check it out, I don't know if you can check it out while the class is going, just tell us what it is later. If you just pulled up sales in that neighborhood the last 12 months, and if you can sort it by by the listing agent on solds, that would be interesting to know. <clears throat> but here's the thing. You can get 100% market share on this idea that I'm sharing with you. So you draw the map, right? And you got your map and walking around. Now you're going to be committed. You want to take over this neighborhood. And it wouldn't matter even if this agent had 10 listings out of 15, you could take it over pretty easy by going and knocking on doors. Just start at the entrance of the neighborhood, follow your map that you drew and you knock on doors till five people answer. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. I'll go through it pretty quick in case you guys aren't going to do any door knocking, but I want you to start thinking like all these different things and what you can pull out of this. So if I start and I knock on doors till five people answer, once five people answer, I'm done for the day. I'm leaving. I'm going to come back tomorrow morning though. <clears throat> and I'm going to start at the beginning, the entrance again, and I'm going to go knock on doors again. And I start with the very first house that didn't answer. And I knock on doors. I skip the houses that answered, put those X those off your map. They're done. You already met those people. And I'll tell you what to say here in a second or give you some ideas on what to say. But then I start at the very first house again. I keep knocking on the doors that didn't answer until I get five people to answer. Once I get five people to answer, I'm done. So this could be 30 minutes. It could be an at what's probably not going to be 30. It's probably going to be an hour to a two hour commitment every day on real like real estate stuff, right? Way better stuff than sitting in your office figuring out who to talk to on the internet or whatever. But so I come back and I knock. Day three, start at the first house again. So basically I've knocked on this first house door every single day until they answer. And then that's when they get an X and they come off. So some of these doors, you're gonna be knocking on their door 30 times in 30 days. Well, it won't take you that long. If you do five a day and it's 150 homes, you're gonna be done with this by March 15th. March 15th, if you started today, you'll be done on March 15th. You will have met every single owner in the neighborhood. Now, here's how you take over the neighborhood. When you answer and knock the door, now this might get some of you to decide to do this. It's COVID. You, it's, you don't want to hand them something. What should I take with me? What should I give them? Go with the assumption that 98 to 99% of them are not moving when you're knocking on the door and they answer the door. They're not moving. So you don't need to give them anything because you're just going to say, step back and say, hey, I'm a neighborhood or I'm an agent in the neighborhood, love this area. And I just like meeting the homeowners to figure out what they love about living here. I'm selling, I'm going to sell a ton of houses in here and keep the values going up for the owners that are in here. And so what will help me is knowing what people who live here like, something along that line. That's going to get it off of me real quick and get them talking about the neighborhood or their house or whatever. I'm not selling them anything. I already know 98 to 99% of them are not moving. That's why I'm not using a real estate script, right? And if they are thinking about moving, they'll bring it up. They'll say, it's kind of weird you stopped today. I really like you, the, what you're asking me here. We were thinking about maybe doing something next month. Great. When, when can we meet? And we'll go over the numbers, right? So that will lead to an appointment. 
However, it's not going to lead to very many. So if I did that and I, until I met everybody and they all got a handwritten note, and they all went on a real true eight by eight, Sean, because you connected with them, right? So they got a handwritten note, no I, me, or my in the note. It just says, always great to hear, uh, or, or it's easy to see why you love the neighborhood and, and the great neighbors that you have. Uh, look forward to keeping in touch and helping your values stay as high as you can get here. Something like that, right? Something generic, not about me. It's all about them. <clears throat> and then just sign it. The drip pieces will begin to be branding me and there will be more phone calls or pop buys later on. So actually a month and a half, five a day, you could take over an entire neighborhood as long as you stay in touch with them after that. So you could provide all kinds of stuff like market value. They're, they're, you're going to be able to start sending them stuff like a printout of the sales in the neighborhood each month. And they're, you're going to work your way up to that. But the reason why it's not going to be a big turnout, if you can just imagine that they're not moving right now, but they are future sellers. In fact, 15 to 30 of them are moving in the next 12 months. So here's why the process, why most people don't do it. Five today, five tomorrow, five the next day. You do it for a week. Uh, I mean, that's going to be real work real work, right? I've only met 25 of the 125 people, 150 people in the neighborhood. I've only met 25 of them. So even though there's 150 homes and there's somewhere between 15 to 30 moving, I've only met 25 of them. So the chances are there's only two, two people to four people moving out of the people that I've met so far sometime in the next 12 months two to four in the next 12 months, it just happened to be those 25 people, all 25 of them, none of those four are this month. Or they're probably not even next month because they just were like trying to say, hey, they were being nice, told you about the neighborhood and you left. Real estate didn't come up. So until you get going through the neighborhood, until you get to the end of the month, when you've now got 100 people in there, well, now a 10 of those people to maybe 20 of those people are moving in the next 12 months. So you are going to start to pick up one from somewhere in those first hundred. If you stayed in touch, you're going to pick up one or two of them now at the appointments. But that's after a whole month. I'm just getting one or two appointments. But as I get through the rest of the neighborhood and then stay in touch, that two is going to turn into two more. It's going to turn into two more. It's going to turn into two more. I mean, because 30 people moving is two sales a month. So pretty soon you'll get two sales a month out of that neighborhood over the next six months to a year. That's one way. How many of you like that idea? It's like now if I could just get excited about knocking on doors, I could actually take over a neighborhood, right? Um, another one that I have is Monday we talked about buyers. If you have a listing that hits the market, say it's 300,000 say 300, 350, right? If a, mar a house hits the market, you could search a five, five mile radius of that listing, just go around it and pull up houses that sold for 150,000 back five years ago, five to 10 years ago. So go five miles, look at sales five to 10 years ago, because People typically move within five miles of where they currently live and they usually buy up 50%. So if I'm looking at sales five years ago, they were probably 150 then, they're probably selling for 200, two and a quarter now. And we got a $300,000 listing on the market. So the $200,000 buyer is gonna buy a $300,000 house and they're gonna move within five miles. So I shared that with you Monday on how to find buyers for your $300,000 listing. Flip it back around though, because now you've got the same exact thing to go find sellers because you're calling on houses that sold five to 10 years ago. You're actually finding sellers that way. And if you do this with buyers that you're working for, so for example, I, somebody just said to me at the office the other day, it's like, I got a seller that's kind of on the fence and they're like, I can't really put my house on the market because I don't have anywhere to go. Is anybody else on the call feeling that same way? Like if you could find them a house, then they'll probably put their house on the market. But we know we can't write contingent offers because it's too competitive, right? So you can do the same exact thing to find a listing for your buyers. In fact, you can tell your buyer, what's your perfect house? I want a four bedroom, two story, three car garage, finished basement with a fenced yard. And normally we would say, well, we can't be too picky. If we found that exact same thing without the fenced yard, would that work? Because we don't have very much inventory. 
Well, no, you can go in and search five to 10 years ago, five miles around their school that their kids are going to and search for the exact house, two story, finished basement, fenced yard. And if they bought five to 10 years ago, you can now find a listing for your buyer. And when I'm talking about finding sellers, yeah, that could be a double dip on there, but you're probably going to have to find two or three of those before your buyer finds one they like enough to buy. So there's another thing. How would you like to be known in your database? Because you're talking with, once you get connected with people, like we, t people talk real estate all the time when you're like connected with them, but they usually don't throw it out there if they're not connected because they don't want to get into a listing appointment, Right. So, but when you're connected, they talk real estate stuff all the time, casually with you. You're like, oh my gosh, somebody says something about, yeah, my aunt in California got outbid on a house. There was like 27 or 37 offers or something crazy. It's like, I know that that's crazy market. I mean, I've actually just been going and finding properties that aren't listed yet that are the perfect dream house for a buyer. In fact, the Joneses, we just found them one that they didn't have to compete with and they got it for fair market value, right? So because you're selling it to that seller, it's your listing and you're getting, you're telling them you got a buyer for it, but I'm telling you, you're going to get two other listings because they're not going to buy the first house they look at. You're going to pick up two other listings for the one that they actually end up buying. And if that happens, uh, I would probably think twice about collecting, not collecting 100% of all the commission. Because if you got a listing here that you can get your listing commission and you can sell this buyer a house and get a commission, then you probably, if you connected that deal and they didn't have to compete and they got a fair price and they were happy and now you picked up another buyer, I mean, you could probably knock a little bit off, but you've earned both sides of those commissions. Uh, you found them a great deal and they didn't have to pay 20,000 over because there were 10 other people fighting over it. So you, you do whatever works for you, but I'm saying you've earned that from both sides. So anyway, so that's another way. Um, five to 10 miles and just base it on the price range of whatever, whether it's a listing coming on or finding one for your buyers. How many of you like that idea for finding a house for your buyers or your future sellers? Are you sitting on? Go ahead. I tried. Um, I just did that door knocking thing like two weeks ago because I'm looking for a, like four trailers for this lady. So I, I like door knocked uh in these trailer parks uh a lot of it was like listing le leasing and uh selling so i did try all that i'm, I'm gonna try with uh, what you were saying yeah cool all right guys so that's another way um and then the another one i'll give you and then we'll kind of go through some of this other stuff in the book here but expireds and withdrawns it's actually expired, withdrawn, canceled, anything where they took it off the market. And that would be probably in the last year to two or three years. Because one of the things that we find is like, if somebody listed a house, and it's usually like expired listings, especially in this market, there's not going to be as many of them. However, there are still more than you think. And when you start looking in the MLS and checking it, you're like, dang, I didn't think there would be any expireds in this market, but there are some or they canceled it or pulled it off the market. They did something real quick. It wasn't going the way they wanted or they didn't like the realtor and they pulled it off or something just came up and they pulled it off. So canceled withdrawals, that kind of stuff. If you go back a year to two years ago, maybe even three, something came up or they either tried to sell it for a certain amount of time. And in the old days, it was like a six month listing. They might've gone with the second agent for six months if they had it overpriced. And this is before our crazy market three years ago, right? So they, they finally just got frustrated and took it off the market and kind of went about their lives and took a break. They always take a break from all the showings. Well, that means that now they've been sitting there for another year and it's starting to stew up again. So they just got caught, caught up in being busy and, and free from it, but now they're thinking about it again. So again, when you look at those, Make sure you check the history on it or whatever. Make sure it hasn't sold since then. So if I go back three years, I got to make sure it didn't sell sometime in the last year and a half or two. Same thing with those sold from five to 10 years ago. If they bought it five years ago and it's 50% down, look at the history. And if it sold three years ago, then it's different owners. That's That one's, just take that one off your list. So there is a little bit of research in these things. But if you truly are like, 
I'm going to focus on sellers. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, when the inventory is low, anytime inventory is low, you just have to put the pedal to the metal on that thing to get ahead. Because in this market right now, if you want to carry three listings or five active listings, you're probably going to have to get 10 to keep two on live, right? Because the other ones are going to sell so fast. So that means you got to get 20 to finally get 10 that are on the market at any given time because some of them are selling the day they hit. So that's crazy. But if you do that and you get your pedal in that fast and you get ahead of the market, that's where you're going to get that comfort level again, where you're not coming into work every day going, I guess I'm out of business, right? All right, let me pause there for a minute, just see if there's any questions on this finding seller leads, some of those things I talked about. Yeah, I give you a couple of good ideas or get you thinking a little bit differently about really, truly being on purpose about finding some sellers. Was he expired or the withdrawn? How do you contact them? Do you call them or send a handwritten note or? Yep, any way that you can get into a two-way conversation with them is going to be best, okay? Because everybody, just talk to all the agents that have been in our office forever and ask them how well mailings work to expireds and, and FISBOs and stuff. It doesn't. It's a 1% to 2% conversion rate, maybe a 3% conversion rate. Or if they are getting better return, they might share that. You got something to add? Not the commission. Hey, Brad. Um, I did that research you're talking about with the local agent expert in my area. Yeah. And I put it in the chat. Um, in the last 12 months, within a quarter mile of my house, there were 43 sold. Yeah. And right. that agent had six of them. Six and of no, them. And nobody else had more than two. Yeah. <laughs> your number, your numbers are right on. Yeah. It, well, I just see it over and over and over again. And I'm that guy that whenever we say stuff, I just like, okay, so let's check it. Let's because we we tell our thing, we tell ourselves things that we hear and then we believe them to be true. And it's like they they could be, just check the numbers. And that's what I've seen every time we've checked that number. So it's like, holy crud, there's a whole lot of market share to be taken, right? So, ah, oh, thank you for sharing that. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. And you'll really see that in a neighbor. If you if you go by subdivisions, it's even smaller. So that's that's freaking awesome. A quarter mile. That's probably a couple different neighborhoods. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, so yeah, back to the expireds and stuff. I'm putting in here. This is the one thing that I find uh, to be really helpful for finding phone numbers and stuff. Fastpeoplesearch.com will find a lot of people's information because you can put in their name and their city. So like if you pulled up an expired, you can pull up the tax record. So you got their name in their city and it should, if it finds them, it'll give you a bunch of their last addresses. It'll give you all the phone numbers they've ever had. And sometimes it'll give you emails that they've had. The thing with that though, is now I need to call through all those numbers. They're gonna be dead numbers. They're gonna eh, 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 recordings. You, it doesn't even know if you don't even know if you're getting a hold of the right person. But that, so it's a little bit of work when you don't know them at all. But again, I want you to think a little differently here. And this is how you find more sellers. It kind of goes back to what I talked about on the Facebook friends list. So if it were me and I just heard this class and I was like, how do I find the information for a, a expired? I go back to the story that I said at the very beginning. I heard somebody was selling, somebody I knew knew them. And if they could get me an in with them and put in a good word, like we heard, I think that was Eric that was sharing that story, wasn't it? Or who was that? Is that yeah, Eric? it yeah. was me. I thought it was you. So like Eric shared earlier where that exact thing happened where his friend said that. So take that. This is where I hope you can start relating this stuff to real world stuff. So pull that person up. See if you can find them on Facebook. And you don't have to be their friends to find them on Facebook and then look at their friends list and you're not friends with them yet. So you won't have mutual friends listed, but just skim through. There's a thing called six degrees of separation. There's someone on their list that you know. In fact, there might even be somebody on their list that you kind of know. Maybe it's your pastor from church or a grade school teacher for your kids, right? So you click on their profile and it opens up their Facebook page. Now you start going through the list again and you see who's friends with them. So you can call that person and ask how well they know them. And once you friend them, you can get all your mutual friends listed. And then that's how I would go in after it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Figure out, figure and out, go ahead. 
And then the final step was making sure that I uh, showed appreciation to the friend that gave me the recommendation, send them a little gift card and note and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, I, whenever somebody refers or in, endorses um, a $5 Starbucks card to reward the activity, not the result, um, is a great way to do that. Because if they get that gift card, let's just say the note card just says, you know, thanks for going out on a limb, giving that third party endorsement. You, you know, I, I will always work as hard, if not harder, for somebody that backs me up like that than anyone else. So tomorrow, leave for work 15 minutes early, swing by Starbucks, take your favorite book, kick up your feet and enjoy a coffee on me. So it's a $5 Starbucks card because I love, like the other thing is I hear people go, oh, well, we're at luxury. We really can't do a $5 Starbucks card. Listen, what I create is the experience of why don't you take a relaxing morning to sit down and read a book for 15 to 30 minutes. Go, go to work a little early, take this card with you, get your favorite coffee, sit down and enjoy a book. So now I'm not giving away a $5 Starbucks card. I'm giving away a, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. I think I need to do that. Whatever it might be. Um, we used to give out movie certificate or just the $5 to AMC. And it's like, take a night, grab some popcorn and the kids and go enjoy a movie together. So it wasn't the $5. It was the have a movie night with the family because you can't go to the movie for $5. It's actually going to cost them more money to get to give that referral or to get that card, right? Um, cool. Good stuff. All right. Anybody else on anything you want to add to that conversation or finding those sellers? Brad, I have a quick question. This is going back a couple points about um, door knocking. Um, before door knocking, do you look to see um, what houses are rentals or do you just treat those as potential buyer clients and still knock or what do you... Yeah, so college, as we have a lot of college rentals. So like these, you know, a yeah. house of college boys are all moving on kind of thing. But yeah, well, you kind of know which neighborhoods are really that. And, and if you're targeting rental, like if you're targeting absentee owners to get their properties listed, I mean, you could do that to figure out who the landlord is if you don't know from tax records or something. But yeah, I mean, you're if you're going to have a random rental here and there. That's one thing. You're probably not marketing to a whole neighborhood that's all college kids, though. That's not where you're going to look for listings, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a good question, though. So you could filter it that way. I probably, I personally wouldn't put that much thought into it. I'd just go, right? And 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 again, if you're looking at Three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar single family homes, and that's what your market is. That's that's the way to do that. The apartment buildings and and absentee owners, I would probably be doing that a little bit different way. So that one to find sellers, those are good ones. If you're driving by and you know where there's rentals, snap a picture of the house. We used to turn. I don't remember who it was, but they would turn that into a postcard and go, "Have you been by your rental lately?" And they would drop that in the mail to them, right? And it would just say, hey, if you'd like to know the current market values, and, and again, they're usually absentee owners, so I'm not going to be able to knock on the door, and I might not get that two-way conversation first. But again, if I'm showing them what their property is, there's value in them picking up the phone to go, hey, when was that picture taken, right? Or if it looks crappy or whatever. But that will just start to get that. You're looking for something of value to get them to pick up the phone and call you. An absentee owner would do that. A homeowner who's thinking of selling and you're just blasting out postcards to a neighborhood and 98 of them aren't moving out of 100, then the postcard is not going to do you a whole lot of good. But even the landlords, if you're, if you're setting it up to just be the information source for them on the market stats and what's happening, they're going to jump all over that because nobody else is offering it to them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you were going down the rental radar, you just were wondering if you bumped into something that's a rental, they'll tell you, oh, I just rent. I, you know, I said, okay, do you like the neighborhood though? You know, and I would just play that off and move on. Okay. So it, it's yeah, about I, I asked because, uh, you know, folks talk about, you know, trying to be the top agent in their own neighborhood and my neighborhood has, my, I don't know, I would guess maybe 20% rentals. Yeah. Yeah, you could probably map those out and single those out separately, although that little thing that we just talked about would be perfect 
for those 20 houses, you could send them a monthly picture update of what's going on at their property. Yeah. How crazy yeah. would that be, right? And and you're telling that owner, I live in the neighborhood, so I watch the values in here close. Yeah, so yeah. now you're their go-to person. Cool, thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. All right, so just to kind of recap what we've talked about so far, guys, where you're gonna find your seller leads. I, I cannot tell you enough how big your database is because it is, I mean, it's exactly what Eric was talking about. That's really happening out there. The reason we're not getting those, those endorsements and more referrals is because we haven't even really connected with the database yet, and we're not staying in touch with them. So every person from this day forward, stay in touch with them. Your daily 10-4, writing your 10 notes a day. During Ignite, your challenge is to write 10 notes a day, go view four properties a week, all that stuff. So you're going out there and plugging into the market and seeing what's out there. So being out there and connecting with 10 people a day is your database, really. Um, but getting that brand awareness and being plugged in. Open houses, the thing that I remember about NAR saying something about like 72 or 73% of all buyers actually own a property, so they have a house to sell. And what's very interesting about this, when we're talking about numbers and having Eric pull those numbers up in that neighborhood, what's very interesting is how many buyer leads come into a big team, for example, if they've got internet leads and stuff coming in, they got a thousand leads. If they actually got a hold of a thousand people and 72% of them own homes, they should have 700 listings to go along with the thousand buyers. Never seen it. I don't know what happens. I don't know where the disconnect is happening. Well, I do know what the disconnect is happening. They're not asking the buyers if they own a home that they're selling. You think we are, but we are not because we're not getting 72% listings. We're not even getting 50% listings from the buyers. I don't know what the heck happens to their house and who sells it and why they wouldn't use you if they were buying a house with you. Or it's probably more realistic that out of a thousand leads that come in from an internet site, you're only talking to a hundred of them maybe if you made a good attempt to reach most of them and you're only getting about 20 of them closed. So you might be picking up and actually the, the one statistic that I shared with you guys where we track that, I'm just a number tracker like crazy. We did the exact thing, a thousand leads, came to a hundred of them, got in the database, we closed 24 of them. But now what I didn't do that time was go back and see if those 24, we should have gotten 10 or 15 listings. I know we did not. So I don't know what happened with the sale of the home and why we wouldn't have gotten the listing, but somehow some of those got away. We might've gotten four or five. And that's what I see like across the board when agents are tracking their business is that we, we, there's a lot of opportunity to grab some more listings in there. And it's about asking. <clears throat> so I know one example could be if you got leads coming in, if, if it's a team member that's handing buyer leads out, one thing you could do is if you convert that buyer lead into a listing appointment, like, like let's just say if you're a team that the Rainmaker's doing all the listings and they got buyer's agents doing all the buyers, not doing both sides, but they're doing that stuff. I've seen teams set up this way a lot because then everybody's specialized and they're getting really good at one thing and really good at converting like Eric on his scripts. I mean, he's on the same scripts all the time. I don't know if you list and sell both, but the point is here is that if it's a Rainmaker with listings and you're giving all these buyers, every buyer away to your buyer's agent team, you could reward your buyer's agents by saying, if you get that buyer turned into a listing appointment that would come back to the Rainmaker, but if you do that, you get all the leads off that listing when it goes on. It does not go into rotation. It does not go into the team business. If you got a listing appointment, you're rewarded by us singling that out and every lead that comes off that listing that you secured, you get all the buyers from it. it won't go into the pool. You're never going to run out of listings to be in the pool. However, now there's an incentive to make sure they're asking. I know when we tracked this, it went up like triple the listing appointments off the buyers. And that's how I figured out that that was really happening out there, that we are missing listing opportunities. Um, and in fact, by doing that that way, you're actually not going to lose some buyers too. It, from buyers, even though we're on sellers right now, um, there's a lot of internet buyers that are getting away from you um, that come in, you may call once, you talk to them a couple of times, but then you know when you feel like they've ghosted you or they're not calling you back or something, there's buyers that are getting away from us every single day. And they, those may have been the potential listings as well. Because you got to assume 
once they become a seller in this market, if they say anything to anybody at work, man, you better have been in touch with your entire database. Because I know in Topeka, your, your, your database will cover quite a bit of Topeka. You probably have somebody in every workplace somewhere or at church or something. So when these people start talking about selling, you're going to get a shot at it before they give them their list of, before three different friends give them three different names and numbers. And if you haven't been in touch with your database, your name's not even getting mentioned in that batch. So that's another reason why the, the database is huge. But open houses, I mean, you, I, I never held open houses to sell the house that I was sitting in. If any of you could probably relate, if you've done open houses regularly, you usually don't sell the house that you're in at the open house. The whole purpose is to meet buyers who are thinking about buying or selling. And most of the people that come through open houses are probably still three to four months away from being a buyer. They were just driving by going, hey, let's just go look. And all of a sudden they're, they're getting it turned on to maybe want to buy or sell, right? They're getting ideas and then they start to get excited. Then they got to go get pre-approved. So they're even pre-buyers at open houses most of the time. You'll probably have more real buyers in today's market because of the shortage of homes. You throw an open house sign up the day you made it live on MLS, you're probably going to have 50 people through and you might sell it with multiple offers. So that's going to happen more today. But in general, you got to assume that of all those, that if the five buyers that came through that didn't buy that house, three of them are sellers too. So you want to get them in your database, write them a handwritten note, put them on an 8 by 8 and 33 touch and work for that listing appointment as well. Because most of them are going to be listings too. And then the referrals come with that tapping into the database. So qualifying and converting seller leads. You know, a lot of these scripts, there is a script book. I think I showed it to you in the last session. Uh, it's the Spark script book. And it's in, um, actually, I don't know if I attached it to there. It's in the Google Drive where you get your manuals. There's a resource library where you can download the scripts. And so one of the things I, I was talking about earlier when it said, you know, thinking about buying or selling and you knocked on the door and you didn't get the appointment, write down the objection that they gave you to not list with you. Like one of them would be that you would hear today is, well, we, we don't want to necessarily put our house on the market today because we don't know where we would go if we sold it too fast, right? So that's an objection you write down because you didn't get the house listed. And then you go in the script book and find three things that you could say to get them off the fence. Because there's a lot of things you could say to get them to get off the fence. They can't go write a contingent offer on a house. So that's not an option, right? Now, if you're one of those agents that's going out and hunting for their perfect house so they don't have to compete, you could use that. And if they list now, they have complete control over when it closes, especially if the people are fighting over it. So right now they could write, they could put their house on the market today. If they got multiple offers, they could take the offer that says, we'll wait until you find a house. We'll give you 90 days to find another house because we want your house bad. We want it better than, better than the other five people. Did you know that they can do that? I mean, a seller gets to control the closing date, especially if they have 10 or 20 offers. It's like, listen, we like your offer the best. If you gave us 90 days to find a home, if that buyer says, now we can't do that. We have to be in in 30 days. Well, they either pay $20,000 more so you can pay for a hotel for 90 days. That would work. You're not telling them that. Your, your client can make that decision or you got other offers that you can go to and let that one go. So by waiting to put their house on the market, they're not going to have those opportunities later on. So they're still going to be in the same boat. So there's all kinds of scripts you can use to get these people to move it up be on the market today and keep those listings flowing so you can get them the most money possible and help them buy a house while the rates are going up. You don't want to wait till values are coming back down to buy a house because then their values are going backwards from what they're buying the house for. So waiting for the market to turn around or come back down and get more realistic really doesn't make any sense in the appreciation conversation at all. If it's coming back down, values are now going down. Why would you buy then? You want to you sell at the highest you can buy. Yeah, you might be buying high, but the market's still going up. So you got a chance right now to make some appreciation. Those are all scripts to get your sellers to list. But all this stuff, why are you moving? We talked about the big why early on. And these are all just qualifying your sellers to find out, you know, 
what what's important who's going to be living in the house with you why it was it close to work what are you trying to be close to um when's when do you want to move by why is that date important and just asking those questions so that you can tie into those to get them to list now and this is the other thing we saw this in the last session too and i'll pause out for a break here in a second but we are a minute we're right at the top of the hour here so i just got to grab a couple more slides and i'll open it up for questions but on just like the buyers with the drip plan, you're gonna move everybody from a C, they're gonna call you when they're a B and they're gonna call you when they're an A. The chances of you calling out and always finding A's are one to 2% of the time. The other problem is, is we find a lot of B's and C's and they're C's so we don't put a whole lot of weight in them because they're doing something next year and then we don't stay in touch with them again. We think we're gonna call them next year when they're ready and then we call them and they've moved six months earlier. So you get every single person on a follow-up plan in your database, and you will establish over time that you are the go-to person by providing good information. By the way, the 98% of the people that aren't moving right now don't need to get a ton of real estate stuff every single month. They don't need all real estate drip plans. The only people who need all real estate drip plans are buyers and sellers relating to fixing their house up and getting more money and getting it ready to sell as soon as possible. And, or if you're not driving by the properties, you're missing stuff for the buyers, right? So we let them move themselves up from C to A. And then when you take your book and you're looking at the scripts and stuff, just going back out there and categorizing your buyers. And when you're putting them in uh, uh, command, like we don't really go through a ton of command in this class because it's an hour but I just wanna point out a couple of things so you know how to go in and play with command and learn how to use it for the topics that we're talking about. So in converting leads to contact, yeah, you gotta ask for the appointment, ask for a referral and ask them to reciprocate the connection that you've made. We kind of did it the other way around. Start looking for the people that have connections with the people who might be selling, then you can get that referral or that third party endorsement and then that will get you the, appoint, the appointment with the person in a totally different way than calling a stranger trying to get the appointment. But there's scripts in there. If you are calling strangers and just looking for listings, there's all kinds of scripts in the book to use. However, the database is still going to be the pipeline packer to where your phone just rings. Pre-qualifying -pre sellers. Uh, again, in the pre-qualification, you've got in your uh, handout, there's actually an intake form uh i've got my i got a sample one this is the one that's in your book right here where you can grab the information and it's got questions to ask so if you have these sitting in your office you can just go through and ask the questions this is uh one that our team uses all the time and it's basically starts where what date it came in how they heard about us get their information their address and their phone number for sure um start asking about the house and then any comments but we also asked down here for, do you know about what your mortgage payoff is? And that way we can run a net sheet for them when we go to the listing appointment. And before, I don't just show them the net sheet and say, here's everything it costs to sell your house. The script is, tell me this, if you were to write, get a check, right? Like if I were just to write you a check right now for a dollar amount and hand it to you and you're done with the house, what does that amount need to be? That's a great script. And there's a lot of agents that use this one because it gets them off of the price and it's focusing on the net. Now, if you're in a $500,000 listing, they usually respond with 500,000. It's like, no, no, I, may, I, I said that wrong. Cause you've got a, you got what, a $250,000 loan. Yep. And you're gonna have closing costs, there's commission, you, or you got taxes, you got the title company. By the way, I throw the commission in the middle. So it's buried, not to avoid it. Just, I don't wanna end on it and say, and the commission because then it's like, oh, that's how we start having the commission objection co conversation. If you just bury it in the middle and I show it to them, right? It's right there on the net sheet. But say, no, you have a $250,000 loan, you got some costs. Like I'm talking about after your loans paid off, your taxes are paid, all the costs to sell, everything. You get the check that's left over. What does that amount need to be? Now, most of the time your sellers don't know the answer to this. I'm talking 99% of the time they don't know the answer to this. And they're like, well, I mean, we really don't want to give the house away. Okay, so what are you doing with the money? It's like, well, we want 20% down on the new house. Okay, so we're looking for a three, a, 
a, a million dollar home, so they got to have 200,000, whatever it might be, right? <clears throat> so they're in a $500,000 house, they got $250,000 loan, they're probably sitting at about 200,000 net. And they might say something like, and hey, we wanted to pay off this one car and this car. So how much is that? Uh, it'd be 225. Okay, so 225,000. Well, let's look at what it's gonna cost us to sell the house based on the prices that we were talking about. And there on the net sheet is the estimated price that we thought it should be. It's still an estimate. So if, there, if I'm 100,000 low, I can raise it. If I'm too high, I can lower it and adjust the net sheet down at the bottom but it has all their sample costs in there. And it's like, well, so at that 500,000 we were talking about, cause they were probably thinking they had to sell for six, right? At the 500,000, you're gonna net $235,000. And they're like, oh my gosh, well, that would work, right? And so now I can get them to price the house right and still get the net that they want. So getting them on the net is like an important one, but that's why we do that with the, the seller pre-listing questionnaire. There's another one. How'd you hear about me? So that you can send that note card to thank them. All right. So last thing on here, the listing presentation. We're not, this is about finding the sellers. We will actually go more into listing presentations and some of that stuff in the uh, seller part of the next section. Um, but I'm telling you, command has all this really cool stuff, like so much you could be distracted for days on it in command. So don't get too caught up in this. Uh, I think until you're doing your five a day and working out of your workbook, you don't even need these listing presentations yet. You need to get some listing appointments first so that you have to go in and find the listing presentation. That's how you'll figure out command a little quicker, right? You'll scramble on your first one. You'll kind of remember where it is on your next one. And then by your third or fourth one, you'll know exactly which ones you like and what you're going to pull down and use. So get the appointments first, then go find all the content, but it's all in there. There's you can redesign that 50 different ways in command. So whatever style you like. All right, that actually got us to the end, just a few minutes over. So I'll reopen it back up. It, what, what questions did I spur out of any of this or clarity or anything you guys wanna add? Finding sellers. Is your mind blown or did I wear you out? There was a lot of content in this session. So, all right, guys, go back and watch these recordings. We're going to be getting all the recorded uh, calls back out to you. So you can go back in and, and pick some things out of them and hear them again. Um, go back through your manual, go back through your notes, send me any questions that you have. Um, Y'all should have my cell phone number. I think just about everybody should have it. But if you don't, there it is. And my email is in here too. All right. Okay, guys. Well, we will see you on Friday.